Welcome to the Untitled Car Project podcast. Your one-stop show about Indian car enthusiasts capable of giving Dominic Toretto a run for his money. With serial gearhead Siddhant and Shivam, here we go. Prithvi Ray, how are you, sir? I'm great. I'm great. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for doing this. It's really a pleasure to talk to you all. Same here. The pleasure is ours. And uh, how have you been? How's the COVID situation been for you? How are you sort of navigating through it? Yeah, well, the COVID has been difficult. I mean, you can't go outside the house much. I try. I've got elderly people at home, so I'm trying to keep them quarantined as much as I can. Work. You know, now that the companies know that you don't have a life to go back to after work so everybody's being worked doubly hard i mean it took a yeah. bit of time but you know i guess the mentality in india is a bit of a diff- unless you see your employees in front of you you generally are un- uncomfortable bosses so it took a while to get the you know the paradigm changed but it eventually work is working out nice i mean people are happier working at home and i'm happier as a boss that i can actually ask them to work late <laughs> so <laughs> it's a mixed bag you know So I, I do you often find yourself burning through the midnight oil Yeah yeah the oil the work I mean see my work is slightly different from the regular 9 to 5 so I it's more project based so sometimes when there's a project which has come up like high critical project it goes on till like I've been on conference calls for 7 and a half hours straight so <laughs> yeah so yeah it's That's a lot Yeah that's a pro- that's something you get used to I mean that's how how at least the, my job works like that so how do you get used to seven and a half hours and then working on your car as well yeah see, right now unfortunately or fortunately for me i sold the skoda the lora to a very dear friend the of mine french yeah that's the tabai that's a, that's, a, that's a interesting nickname you know it was so given we'll to, get to that we'll get to that yeah 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 we'll talk, definitely talk about the tabai yeah no i mean <laughs> the car is working i mean whatever i little i can do on the new car the rs245 it's still a baby right now it's still stock and just trying to figure out what it needs driving it daily you know taking it i mean i got it about 2 months ago i've done about 2100 kilometers on it so so far it i just try to make sure as much as i can drive it as much as i can otherwise it just stagnates just still breaking into the new car you like let yeah, me yeah, keep it know. stock for a while No, no, I'm not going to keep this talk. Not that is not going to happen. You know, <laughs> there's a particular way. I, I mean, there is no particular way of going about modifying a car. Everybody has their own way. My way comes from my experience of modding cars for so long, and I have a particular way of going about it. First six thousand kilometers, I try to keep it as stock as I can, unless there's some glaring issues that I feel that need to be addressed. Because you know, if, if your car, if your car from the factory survives six thousand kilometers. then all the issues that could have come up from the original car or from faults in the original parts have already come up so yeah. you would know if something isn't working right within the first 6000 kilometers and then you can start modding it then you can go all crazy about it it doesn't at least from my perspective it doesn't make sense starting to mod a car from day zero it's you, know, yeah. you, you just bought it at least enjoy it So when we spoke on the phone initially um you told us that you know you basically start got into this uh, back when you were in the US while you were studying and uh, I- I'm actually in- sort of interested to learn that what car or could be a bike as well that you know yeah. you saw and you felt okay you know what I have to you know learn more about this I have to sort of understand what goes on behind assembling such a beast what was that hmm. particular oh this is it a moment for you see you know for cars i mean i have always been fascinated with machines you know since i was a kid i was taking things apart i mean initially i, st- I started by taking things apart then i got kept on getting beaten up by my parents because i could not put them back together so as a intelligent or at least i would consider myself a little intelligent kid i decided to do take it slowly i would take I dismantle something only up to a point where I can reassemble it again. Reassemble it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah. as time progressed, I became pretty good at it. I mean, I became the house's handyman, 
and you know <laughs> that's that's where the putting things together came in as far as cars go my father was a huge car freak i mean he 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 loves cars now he's a lot older but when he was young he used to love cars you know so he's definitely in the family it's in the family he prefers the stock cars i prefer modified cars that's the difference he is the more of a rear wheel drive guy and i'm more of a all wheel drive guy i mean i've always been all wheel drive guy unfortunately i right now i don't have a option of all wheel drive so front wheel drive it is it's maybe that can be the work that you eventually do it on your oh VRS. yeah oh yeah oh that that is planned that's already planned i have very <laughs> very smartly maneuvered my father into buying a tiguan all space which is the four wheel drive version know the same car i mean yeah. so eventually when he gets bored of it the wheel base is exactly the same the rear exactly the same. so i can easily it will take a while to do it it's not an easy process but i can transplant that drive train into my yeah. octavia rs so yeah everything is a plan everything is a long plan yes i mean like you were saying you no know, as far as the us car scene goes right now i was always interested in driving i my parents were very strict uh that they they were very clear until you're 18 there's no driving for you so when i when i'm 18 get into driving school get your driving license then we will decide what car you get and <laughs> unfortunately for me by the time i got graduated from school and got my driving license it was time to go abroad so the only car i mean they never bought me a car they i was using my sister's automatic zen i mean i think that was one of the first automatic zens in india and so that's where the the bug started i mean it's a fantastic car you know the then although the auto was a pretty terrible gearbox but it for as a beginner i think it's much easier to learn an automatic car than a manual car because you are you got one less pedal to worry about you're just focusing on yeah. getting the feel of the car yeah. you know getting your input right you know unless when you throw uh, another manual into a uh, clutch into the mix with just a brake and accelerator you're adding more confusion So I learned yeah, on an right. automatic car. I learned on my sister's automatic Zen, and my uncle who had just come back from Hong Kong, he also could not drive a manual. So he had the automatic S Team. I think it was called the Maruti Thousand back then. Thousand back then, so, yes. Yeah. So he had a Maruti Thousand. So I used to kind of bribe my driver with some mithai and cigarettes, and we used to <laughs> steal my uncle's car and run away to learn driving. <laughs> so eventually, when my dad did find out, it was very actually very interesting thing that happened. So when I one day I my driver used to come and drop us to school, and my school although it wasn't very far off, but it used to have a couple of uh, main roads to cross. So my mother was a little paranoid about us walking down. So one day, as usual, I was the late. I was a, I'm a late riser. I can't get up in the morning. I just don't like getting up in the morning. <laughs> so I decided to my driver showed up, and my sister decided to leave me behind. And that was a critical day for my exam or something. And I knew if I missed it, my mother would kill me. so then i realized you no know, the driver didn't come back and i had to get to school on time so i my uncle's car was parked outside i just took the keys my mother was flam flabbergasted like, what are you doing i'm like i'm going to school he's like how are you going to school there's no driver I'm like i can drive it's like he just stood there at the gate <laughs> oh, completely yeah. dumbfounded thinking what the hell and i just took the car and went off <laughs> and that's the end of it you know when i came back home my mother was screaming at my father my father was completely confused Although, and then she was still telling him that you need to go and school him. How can he take somebody's car and drive? So then I think I that I saw dad coming towards my room, but then he stopped. He went outside, looked at the car, came back, and the only question he asked me from where do you learn to drive? I'm like, I am not stupid. I wouldn't take a car if I didn't learn to drive. He's like, yeah, but where did you learn to drive? I didn't teach you. I know, I know, I know. All of my drivers taught you. So whose car have you learning how been learning how to drive in? So yeah, that's. That's how it started for me. Automatic Zen and automatic Maruti thousand. So yeah, I I would love to talk about the Tabai since we've gotten to the talk. We've gotten to start talking about the cars and also I would love to talk about Tabai and get to know what Absolutely. actually went in the working of you know making of the Tabai. Yeah, you know. What was the Tabai was kind flow? of an accident. It was an accident more or less because when I came back to India, I left US in two thousand nine and I came back to India because. I had an option to stay there and continue for the another six years without coming back home to get my green card, or I come back to India and I start pursue a career in India. And I like India too much. I got too. I guess I'm too desi. So as the saying goes, I know a lot of my friends who stayed back there and are doing very well for themselves. And I guess I had a mentality. I was going to come back home. I never could uh, adapt to a country which is 
which is foreign to me no matter how much english i can speak or how much baseball or you know rugby i like i can never i'm uh, my roots are here and that's where i wanted to be so i decided to come yeah. back here and when i came back here we didn't have any good cars at all i mean there was the only car that irked my eye at that point of time there were two cars which i really wanted to buy one was the ford fiesta i think fiesta had the s fiesta s they had 1.6 yes and then the other one was the octavia rs the original one the the, the box shape yeah. one yeah so by the time i found a job by the time i got to my feet to save up enough money to buy my own car i first went to went to buy the octavia rs and it was sold out they had just discontinued it <laughs> so and like shit so then next i think I'll, next thing i after uh, one depressing weekend of alcoholism i said fine let's go and buy a ford fiesta so i went to buy the fiesta and guess what the weekend that i spent drinking and moping about not being able to buy the octavia rs was the was the weekend when the last fiesta s had sold out and ford had discontinued in india oh my <laughs> so, yeah so i ended up with a i20 petrol automatic manual okay. manual petrol manual spice speed petrol i20 i think they just launched the what is it asta i20 asta 1.2 yeah 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 so i mean i was like you know i am not used to driving in in the traffic in india and dad had big car and i don't like his i mean we have a relationship where i don't drive his car as unless i can afford to replace them if i crash and at that <laughs> point time i couldn't afford to replace the 530i <laughs> at least in indian rupees so So I, I bought the i20. I drove it around for a bit, got used to it, and then one day I, was, I think I'd gone to the dealership to I had the order. No, I had, yeah, my friend had had asked me to come to the Skoda dealership with him, think that he has a surprise for me. So I had gone to that. I went to the dealership and I saw the Laura 1.8 TSI. I think it was yeah, the, yeah. called the Ambient Edition. I was like, okay. He's like, I'm like, yeah, ठीक है तो है डीजल गाड़ी है क्या है नहीं यार ये पेट्रोल है <laughs> okay this is interesting petrol mein kya hai like it's a 1.8 liter turbo and i go oh that's okay i know a lot about turbo cars because i've been hmm, uh, screwing around with turbo cars in the us for uh, almost a decade back back then so then we test drove it i loved it i was like wow this is something i can work on and i drove that car i bought the lora tsi uh, the black uh, black color car it was and i been driving it i It was nice. It was fun to drive. I had, I had almost forgotten how it felt to drive a somewhat fast car in India, because when you're stuck in an I-20 and once in a blue moon I take the 530i out, but that was just is too bulky a car to drive in traffic. So I would weekend maybe go for a drive. So I started with that. Then the Laura VRS came out, and I was like, I was hoping that they would have gotten a two liter in that, but they gave the 1.8. So 1.8. Yeah, so I decided to pick it up. It was, uh, I mean, it didn't sell very well initially because their price is very high. I think they launched at sixteen and a half lakhs. It went up to eighteen and a half lakhs. Then they couldn't sell it for a year, so then they eventually gave it off at about fourteen lakhs. So I bought the car for twelve and a half lakhs, and brand new out of the uh, out of the showroom. It's been sitting there for a year, but still. And then we got started on trying it. I, Around the same time, BIC also had opened up to public, so they had started doing public track days, and I was like, okay, you know, there is an opportunity. I had kind of given up on my motorsport passion when I came back to India because there was not any scene over here. People were primarily into rallies, and I'm not a very good dirt driver, and I can't build dirt cars, so I stayed away from that. But autocross and all was happening, but they were very small scale. So when BIC opened up, I was like, okay, fine, this is not a good, not a bad idea. so they had done the first public track day and i took the lora we are there and i saw that you no know, i was not alone there were a whole bunch of other people who were equally excited about cars because in my school friend circle there aren't many people like me who are into car enthusiasts and as you guys know we are a kind of unique bunch right you know we like, are yeah. kind of outcasts in our own circles until we meet somebody who is a car enthusiast and then it's like uh, in bengali there is a saying which goes ami bhalo tumi bhalo baki sab gaddhe mein dalo so <laughs> so, so that essentially what happens when two car enthusiasts meet in a party and here on bic all of a sudden you had 50 60 people who were equally if not more excited about driving their regular cars on the track and that's when we got started on building the car We're like you know this is a, a 1.8 turbo petrol engine we started doing my i started reading up a lot because the first thing you need to understand before you when you start modding cars is can you mod a car 
in a budget you know yeah. any car and that's the first question modify. anyone would ask yeah and any car can be modified to make any amount of horsepower provided you have the money for it now True. the way i have been modding modify my cars and this comes before the dubai uh, is that i try to find a good base car and in india the best base car that you could find which would give you the best dollar per horsepower or rupees per horsepower at the time was the lora and because it was the only car with a petrol turbo engine it was cheap it was affordable there i did my research i figured out it was the same as a golf 1.8 and Volkswagen has a pretty large aftermarket market community and yeah i started talking to various vendors over here at that time there were only two vendors it was autocycle in delhi who was one of the vendors who were dealing with this car and peets in kerala again one of the one of the only other vendors yeah. i started talking to them we got talking figured out what can be done with the car what can't be done with the car and at that point of time peets had just pumped out three examples of their you know the cheap build expensive build super expensive build for the lora so i went there went to kerala drove all three cars so blown away by it because i come from a jdm world i have owned evos i have owned stis i have owned uh, legacies i have never owned a volkswagen or any german car before I, german. the lora so and they work very differently you know they may be both be 2 liter turbocharged cars but the way a uh, mitsubishi or a subaru generates its power and the way the engine is designed is very different from the way a Volkswagen engine is designed so it took me a while to figure that I, I didn't want to jump into modifying the car immediately i first had to understand what what is it that did make this car tick why is it so popular because i hadn't i mean i i used to race these cars race against these cars in the us but i never i always looked down upon them like eh, bloody golf you know i'm in my subaru 450 horsepower subaru sti and like yeah bloody golf fuck off you <laughs> so excuse my language yeah so uh, now that i'm right. stuck in one uh i was like okay fine let's try to figure out how to how this works so we started taking it apart you know going pulling things apart slowly to see what what is how the engine works what what are the sensors the ecu relies on what are the limits of those sensors you know it yeah. involves a lot it's not as all glorious as it seems it's just it's about basically taking apart the cars uh, the belly pan of the car looking at all the sensors what sensor is where reading the part numbers going on to bosch's website because bosch was making parts for all german cars so yeah. i mean from everything from a bmw to all the way to a bugatti will have a bosch sensor on it so you go to the boss sensors bosch's website look up the part number understand the limitations of the sensor and then speak to the stick to tuning company who who was at the time developing map for these cars and saying that no this is the limitation of the sensor can you guys how close can you guys get it to the limit without compromising yeah. the engine fortunately i didn't have to go that far because this was a pretty popular platform in the in europe the octavia yeah. in russia is very very popular car so there was whatever i wanted to do somebody had already done it, done it. so yeah. it's just about going through the various forums that have information on this car and learning about what they what is the what is the end goal we started off with just making it a handling car i wasn't very sure that these engines would last very well on indian petrol so yeah. we first the first mod i put on the car was the exhaust because it was too quiet so we <laughs> made it loud then we dropped it we got a i got i guess i was the first guy in north india to get a coilover system back then no we even heard of coilovers everybody was like oh springs lagao so i yeah, or springs kato or refill dampers yeah, yeah. so i got the coilover because thanks to my experience in the us i knew how to at least make a car handle the way i want to i may not be a, may not be that great a driver but i can still build cars as to handle the way you would want to want it to handle so we put on the coilovers and we went to went on track and i have a video of one of my friends at that point in time he also had a similar car he had the 1.8 tsi passat which was the same engine a slightly yeah. stiffer chassis and he had a stage 1 map and just a software map on it and we we said we were like you know let's see who, if i can outrun you or you can outrun me so it was even though it was a track day in which there's no race you were just racing against yourself you just timing to so i actually kept up to him kept up with him and he's a very aggressive driver you know i consider myself a significantly tame driver i could you would call me a pussy when i'm on track because i don't want to i love my cars and i don't want to 
push them to the limit. If a car can go 100, I'll go 60. Maybe 70 <laughs> if I don't like the car that much. But I'll never yeah. go 100. And this friend of mine, he goes 110 on his cars. So we we did a few laps and it was very clear that I, I, I kept up with him. He could not pull away from me even though he had a power advantage. And because he was such an aggressive driver, I was a little scared of overtaking him in the corners. So he might like, you. Yeah, I, there was no way he could pull away from me in the corners. He would pull away from me in the straights. And by the time we ended up on lap, ended up on the last corner of the circuit, I'd be right on his tail and about to overtake him. So that's when people also noticed that. And I was like, oh my God, how is the stock Laura staying with this, staying with the 210 horsepower Passat? I mean, and that's when things got interesting. We said, you know, this platform has potential. And slowly but steadily, we started building. You know, as track days got more regular, people also got more interested. And I also revived my interest of, you know, improving the car as a package, right? I wanted to get better lap times. And in... So did you even put a uh, ECU this thing? What ECU were you running? Was it stock or did you get a standalone? Okay, stock. Entire, cars, entire time. Entire time. There's okay, no point time. of running a standalone ECU on these cars. Okay. So first we went about fixing the handling of the car because there was a lot to be desired from the way it handled. And then I was coming from Evos and STI. So I was used to having a car which was stuck to the ground, which would do exactly what I tell it to and not complain. And here I was in a front wheel drive car which would understeer in the corner. Understeer which would, in the corner, which would, yes. And it was a long wheelbase car so the tail would nicely slap around like a fish. So we had to fix that, all of that. So we started with the suspension, once we got the suspension right, then we put in a downpipe and went to stage two, which is about 220 horsepower. And then we figured out that the car is phenomenal at that point. You know, it was a very reliable car. It was performing well on track and, but the brakes left a little to be desired. So the next modification was the brakes. So we put on the, I think, a six piston caliper from Tarox. I think that was the only company in India which is making available in India, which is making brakes for these cars. Had I had an option, I would have gone for Brembo, but Brembo firstly was very expensive and very because expensive, the importer, sure. importer was in Bombay and Tarox was equally, if not better. So we put on a set of Tarox kits and the way we build it up was every time we would change something in the car, we would take it to the track, time it, do our lap time. I would put in my best effort. It'll take me about two, three track days to actually max the car out. You know, you right. change something, the car's handling changes, the car's power delivery changes. So you go to a track, it takes you a bit of time. I'm not a super driver, so I, it takes me a bit of time to understand what limit has changed and what has gone where. And then do that, drive it around, figure out, okay, fine. Now, every time you change something in the car, which is which from stock to aftermarket, then something else which is weakens. So it's, a, yeah. it's the car is designed with components which are designed to work with each other. If you have a soft suspension, you're going to have soft bushes. If you have soft bushes, you're going to have body roll. If I yeah. stiffen the mm -hmm. suspension, I'm going to overload the bushes. If, I'm going to, if, I, if I stiffen the bushes, I'm going to overload the torsion bars. So it's right. a step by step. You, you see what's, what's, what you want to do at that point of time. Fix that, modify that, take it to the track, see where what is the next weak link in the chain and then you change that and you change that until we got to a point where we maximize the car setup you know the fastest time i did on street tires and because i, I didn't want to spend a lakh of rupees on tires you can get slicks in india or racing slicks or semi slicks in india but they end up costing about how much 1.5 lakhs 1.5 1 lakh 1.5 lakhs on just tires and they last you like three track days so i didn't want to spend that money so i stuck to ps4 which was 90 8900 rupees a tire, ES3 is at the point of time. So keeping the tires aside, we we tried to maximize everything from the chassis, given the current 220, 230 horsepower I was running. Once we get to the point where we can't, where I can't push the car anymore, I mean, I peaked my time on BIC, even after the brakes gave me about four seconds of my time. So that's how much effective the brakes are. Yeah. Because you can brake a lot later, you can brake more later, confident. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. you don't have to be afraid in the back of your mind that if break doesn't break, then what With those exactly. brakes, unless you do something really stupid, break will Forget about it. You slam the brake, the car will stop. <laughs> so we maxed out our time at about 235 to 234, 235, I think that was the time we maxed out. BIC, two sections are only for power, two sections are only for handling. The, I mean, BIC, so, they, they structured the whole BIC thinking that it'll be a F1 thing. 
No, F1 for happen. sure. No, but you know, I found it a very safe track because you know, tracks can be overwhelming for beginners. Like MMRT so, and uh, Coimbatore are extremely overwhelming tracks for beginners. You know, if you go off, you go off. The you might actually yes, slip yes. over. PIC, yeah, it has got so much runoff area. The track is so wide that you can actually begin to begin to push your car and not be afraid that I'll go into a wall. There are, I think, three spots in BIC which are tricky. Rest all, you can just do whatever the hell you want. Unless you do something really stupid, you'll not end up in a wall or upside down. So, okay. So, yeah, yeah so, I was, I just wanted to know that how, if I ask you to compare your Tabai to the current <laughs> car that you have right now, the VRS 245. So, yeah. Your Tabai fully modded with the suspension upgrade, CB brake upgrade. Is it at par or is it ahead of the VRS right now? Oh, it's way, way ahead. It's way ahead. The VRS is too soft right now. I mean, okay. the power delivery, the VRS, I think, has a better low end because of the extra 200 cc. I was sure. a 1.8 liter turb, 8 liter car with a bigger turbo versus yeah. a 2 liter car with a smaller turbo. So the power so you delivery. You did upgrade is your turbo there. In the, yeah, in eventually. The eventually. So, the, so that was a turbo. Uh, I mean, when you upgraded the turbo, and we talked since you told me that you didn't uh, put in an ECU, a so, yeah. uh, standalone ECU, did you reflash your ECU as well? Yeah, yeah. We had to reflash it every every uh, tuning we did. We had to reflash, and we were okay. using off-the-shelf maps, so it was not so-called custom tunes, as the tuners like to call it. It's something that a calibrator sitting in US or Europe yeah. calibrates for your car, and you just slash it in. And it the issues today are a lot more lot smarter, so you give them Definitely. guidance parameters that this is a target that the car is trying to reach, and the ECU will figure it out on how to reach the target. So okay. we had bumped. So finally, after the track times got to a peak, we said, let's move, add more power. And that's when all the problems started. You know, stage two in a car is okay. Up to, up to stage two in a car, you can live with daily. You can, it'll last you forever. The moment yeah. you go big turbo is when you really need to address all the issues. And for me, I had the experience of in my Evo. My Evo was running a turbo the size of my head. And my STI was running something, something called the GT52. I mean, you've heard of GT40. Yeah. This was this was a bigger compressor, bigger thing, and was tuned to run on race gas. So that thing could hit about 500, close to 500 horsepower wheel, on and about around the same amount of torque on on the on the track. So I knew what would go wrong. So we started addressing all the issues beforehand before we put the turbo on. So the the PCV, the fueling, the what do you call the the pressure control, pressure release, intercooler, all the things that you need to have to support a big turbo. We did that, and it so happened that at that point in time there were only I think four or five cars running in India with this turbo. So I was not the first. I don't believe in being the first. I let other people do the R&D for me. I'm very happy yeah, when somebody yeah. is going all nuts on the 245 right now, and I'm like, okay, fine. You tell me what breaks, then I'll fix mine. So. I mean, th th that's how it works, you know. So we put the bigger turbo on. It it ran for about 200 to 500 meters, and then through a check engine light, it went to limp mode. Then we figured out the turbo, in certain cases, was over boosting. It means okay. that the 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 stock car sensor limit. That's this is why I'm talking about sensor limit. The sensor yeah. limit that I had in the car was up to 2.5 bars, including atmospheric pressure. So you had, you could only, the car could only see about, let's say, 0 to 25. That's your gauge, that's your gauge yeah. level. 20, 20, 21 PSI, 22 PSI of boost is the, what the ECU could read. Beyond which, okay. if the if the turbo made more pressure than that, the car would not be able to read it and the ECU would get freaked out and say, you know what, I give up, limp mode. Let's turn the turbo off. <laughs> so that's what happened. So, what, so we, the turbo was running a wastegate, right? Yeah, it the, it basically opens the wastegate. Limp mode is basically yeah, that exactly. the, it runs 100% wastegate duty. 100% wastegate duty, yeah. Obviously, we realized there was a map issue. We went back to a tuner. We worked with the tuner to figure out that, yes, there's an issue with the sensor. It's the car is reaching the sensor's limits. So then the next thing to check was whether I'm reaching the sensor's limit because I'm over boosting or whether I, I'm running out of fuel. So we checked the fueling was okay. So then we said, you know what, let's do a the tuner was APR and they were very very helpful on this on the build of this car. They said, you know, we have a beta file which is a beta map for the car, which is using yeah. the Golf R's three bar sensor instead of the two bar sensor, two and a half bar sensor you have in your car. If you can source a three bar sensor, we'll send you the file. Try it out. So 
so long story short, we, we ran about seven or eight revisions of the file till I got all my issues sorted. And then the car became what it was. And from there, it was just about improving traction, how to put that power down. You're putting about 450 Nm of torque in a front wheel drive car. What do you think is better since you've worked with, you, you've, you must have worked with ECUs and all the standalone ECUs. You must have known about uh, the chip tuning thing that uh, yeah. a lot of people do in India and the flashing. So what do you yeah. think is the best way to, you know, go about your car, tune it? Because I've heard from a lot of tuners that don't chip tune it, spend a little money, go on standalones. It honestly dip- yeah, so it honestly depends on car to car. There are a lot of lot of cars which have their own which with the issues plenty capable of giving you all the features and all the safety factors you need to keep your engine running at an enhanced power level yet give you the reliability whereas there are there are cars in which you you just cannot issue for example if you do a one of the most favorite tuner you know, car platforms in india is the steam right you can't i i am a t13 guy so yeah, i own an exactly. steam 2006 so, so you understand what i mean right? it's one of the most yeah. it's one of the most affordable tuner cars you can create a Definitely. decent amount of power for it you can it's cheap you can buy parts if you crash it you break something and buy parts very yeah. cheap I think Kunal okay. Sharma, you guys interviewed, he's a very close yeah. friend of mine and his esteem is a work of art. I mean, he really works his ass off on this. And it's a good starting platform. So in those cars where the ECU is not capable of, of handling and uh, Ooh, maps or running closed loop or running open loop, yeah. you need an aftermarket ECU. But in most that's of the European it. cars, most of the Japanese cars, which are turbo cars, they generally, the ECU is good enough to map. Yeah, but so what I feel add, is that even if I'm uh, creating my turbo, like uh, I still need to change the injectors to, you know, compensate for the duty cycles and all. See, so it, instead it of if I'm no. spending money, why not mm-hmm. just get a good ECU so that has a ton of controls there, like a who's lot of ECUs that are there in the market. The only question that's is who's going to tune it? Who's going to tune it the bear? Right. So yeah. in today's cars, the, all the cars are more or less as I would call auto tune car. All the factory ECU. The way yeah. most of the cars work today are that the tuner is not essentially programming the exact air fuel ratio or the exact exact you know the whole sure. so called AF, efi electronic fuel injection curve as you they showed yeah, yeah. you are essentially setting targets the issues work on sure. targets right so you set a boost target that by this rpm i want this much turbo output this much turbo. and and this much turbo output i want this much if the turbo output is this much i want this much air fuel ratio and if the air fuel ratio is this much i want but, this but much that, of you, advanced you timing or whatever loop, right? Yeah, for no. that, the thing Open you need loop. a closed loop. Yes, and most of the cars are closed loop now. Everything is yeah. closed loop. Uh, you know, more, the LoRa, for example, I'll give you an example of the LoRa because I know the car... But is it a wide-band closed loop? That's no, the, it's that's not. the it's, issue. It's that calculated. Exactly. Calculated AFR. Exactly. Calculated so that, AFR. That's, but that's the control you get, I feel, on a wide-band closed no, loop. No, you don't. Honestly, nowadays, the cars are very, very advanced, particularly with direct injection. You honestly can almost 99.9% guesstimate with the O2 sensor how much AFI you're okay. running. So we did the, we did this test. We, when we were at uh, there's a com- the, the dyno in Delhi called Speed Sport and Phil yeah. is a very, very well-known tuner for esteem and he has a wide band O2. So I was like, you know, we put the car and we put the lot on a dyno. I was like, you know, this is my calculated AFR. Let's see what your AFR gauge, gauge recognizes. And it was 99.9% accurate what the calculated okay. AFR was. And this is the issue of a car which is a family sedan, not supposed to be tuned, not designed to be tuned. Okay. Whereas the Octavia RS is designed to be tuned. Yeah. So if this issue can do it, modern issues can do it. They are 99. In today's date, unless you want to reduce weight and remove all the other components, remove AC, remove this, yeah. a standalone issue does not make sense. Primarily for three reasons. Firstly, no, there's nobody in India who can tune it properly. There are yeah, not many good dinos in India. Even the dinos that are there, they are either not well calibrated or gives mixed readings. I know this is a controversial statement, but yeah, yeah well, they it's do. Fine, it's fine. Yeah, that's so, it. And the third, the, the final reason is there is no way nobody to tune it properly. You the the cost of a standalone ECU does not yeah. justify the amount of gains you're going to get out of it, unless you're true, building true. a hardcore race car. Like you know, I have got people. My friend has an S4 which is running close to over 500 horsepower, and it was 333 stock. So a car which is running 200 horse, over 200 horsepower over the factory design limit is on in the is on the factory ECU with just a just a, a new software 
put into it by the tuning company. So tuning companies have come a long way. So Definitely. it's much easier for them also to work on the stock ETF than multiple standalone configurations. But then uh, I feel that uh, ref- uh, by reflashing the ECO, the in general, in general, uh, stock ECO has a lot of fail-safe modes. Yeah. When you compare it to the standalone ECO, that is completely in my control. In my control, yeah. as in the person who's tuning the ECO. So yeah. that way, I feel it's much more easier rather than actually reflashing the ECO than figuring out what is the trip. that is going to happen if xyz condition happens it depends on tuners right there are a lot of tuners who just exactly. bump up the bump up the turbo boost and bump up the yeah. air fuel ratio as if you I mean that's not have, how it works it, you it, have to know what's happening yeah so I means people like apr revo who are specializing in the european cars right for particularly the cars that i deal with they have, do a lot of r&d they configure or out of the 250 ecu parameters i'm just taking a wild number yeah. they would calibrate 220 of them 30 would be ac you know how yeah. how very cool and pump and all they would calibrate everything in those cases the standard the stock ecu is good enough in cases exactly. where you are pushing beyond for example in my in my car when i lost when i could not push i went reached the limit of the sensor and we had to do a 3 bar sensor the ecu still could not reach 3 bar so we have a, we had yeah. to scale, rescale the output of the 3 bar sensor to reach the 2 bar limit of the ecu so the, when in this kind of situation the yes, standalone ecu makes sense but for most of the applications that you're doing unless you're adding a forced induction to a naturally aspirated car uh, the stock ecu is good enough stock you need to find a yeah. good good enough tuner who can who takes care of all the parameters so you don't hit that you know those safety protocols or they modify the safety protocol like for example on the gen 3 tsi engine which is in the last yeah. gen octavia rs and this rs245 there's a lot of heat management protocols built into it because this car is a slightly different engine than the lora i mean it's same it's the next generation of the lora's engine lora was a 1.8 gen 2 it's called the ea aaa generation this is also an ea aaa but this is a gen 3a so it's a revision revision of the engine the short block remains the same the head is different and the and because the head is different they they have done something very unique in this car normally if you guys uh, have been turboing your cars or or you know adding aftermarket turbo charges onto your cars you know there's a header the exhaust yeah. header exhaust manifold and onto it the turbo charge is bolted on yeah. in the in the gen 3b or just like gen 3a and gen 3 engines the exhaust header is integrated into the head so there's no oh. header so you're there's essentially no mounting your turbo onto four bolt points that's it so it's yeah. mounted directly onto the head so, and there's no so header visible affect, on the if i'm trying to upgrade my turbo will it not do will it not affect the flange size like each and no, every turbo will have a different flange size there is the there are enough man turbo manufacturers and this is the beauty of you know the whole wag ecosystem that they affects they gen design so many cars and they have yeah. the engine same engine in so many different models of the car that the larger ecosystem of uh, what do you call vendors around them they gen- they create turbos which would bolt onto the same head same four bolt points on the turbo yeah. so for example the biggest turbo that you can get for this car is the EFR 13 31 17 i know it's a big it's like the size of my head and there's one yeah. guy running it in india and it bolts right on and the problem that comes with this kind of a head design is that you went have integrated head integrated exhaust manifold it was done not for efficiency or for for you know more power it was done for efficiency more power. efficiency yeah so, so you are basically it's, having a little bit more scavenging effect in the cylinder because the head is they do it the according man- to the acoustics yeah it sounds horrible it, it's not the yeah. nine to it's more of the harmonics to be exact yeah right so then you have the cooling problems right your that entire manifold because it's sitting inside your head and not on outside hanging off it's heating up the head so there's a cooling jacket which is running across your uh, across the manifold across the head for that particular part and that's cooling up your heating up your coolant also so heat management becomes the issue so all the gen 3 cars have heat management built into it and okay. any good tuner would also modify the heat management protocol so your oil temperature will not shoot up Yeah. Your turbo car oil temperature is everything. If you lose oil temperature, so, your car is gone. No matter how definitely. good a how good AFR you maintain, if you can't keep things lubricated, your turbo yeah, is toast. Your engine is toast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I have lost. I mean, I have I have lost the engine because my I have a BMW 320i, which I bought as a I got a very good deal on it. It was a rear wheel drive turbocharged four cylinder engine, 
and I blew the motor. The I bent a rod in the motor because uh, firstly I was running, running a mixture of fuels. Like I was running 97 and didn't couldn't okay. get 97. And BMW had advertised in India that this car on the regular fuel, so I ran on regular fuel like an idiot, and I bent a rod. <laughs> Fortunately for me, BMW was nice enough to what do you call give me a warranty on the motor. But yeah, so lot can go wrong when you're tuning with aftermarket ECUs. True, true. And the, you need the, to have that knowledge that okay, you need to know that what's happening. It's it's exactly. about peace of mind. You know, a, a a lot of engineering goes into designing a car and designing the control Definitely. systems of the stock ECU. So unless you know exactly what you're doing, stick to the stock ECU because there are a lot of control algorithms in there which are keeping even your modified super high horsepower engine in check and in not check. letting it blow yeah, up. Sure. So definitely does that. Like you know, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. It's like off topic, hmm. but um, like, did you hear about the new uh, scrap policy? Uh, which one? The 15-year-old. Cars, petrol cars, yeah. Are yeah. 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 It's, yeah, it's silly. I mean, they have said that there's a policy there, but at the same time, I think that there is a confusion is there in which the government is saying if you want, you can re register your petrol cars, diesel cars, yeah, 10 year lifetime in NCR on in most metros and finish. Yeah. Then you sell it off to a tier two city. But in petrol cars, I think they have given us an option of re registering the car. Okay. So, so you can re register the car by saying, yeah. You pay some okay. amount of the original registration value, and you you can run the car for another fifteen years. So, it's so good. that's I mean, what people have been doing, except for the re-registration part. They are still running it for twenty years. No, My, exactly. I, I run the AS team. It's been fifteen years. No, I it's actually this. very. <laughs> Very weird, you know. My friend, he, he we met at the one of my friends is getting at putting a dyno in Delhi right now, and mm. he is. I went to went to pick up some parts from him yesterday, and another friend of mine was there, and he has a 2003 C230 CDI, C200 CDI or something, like one of the C class, right? And usually the cops don't stop the big cars; they would stop an S team, yeah. for example, but then they they would not know about the the Mercs because they look new and the car looks brand yeah. new. So he was stopped, and he was he was fined by the cops, saying that your car is more than ten years old. So you you either you sell it off, or you yeah he was had to pay a fine and had to go to court and say explain to explain to the judge why he uh, is running a car more than fifteen years in, in ten years diesel car in Delhi. So people are the cops are aware; they're not stupid. You no, know? we try to we think that the police are a little uh, yeah, still, they don't know as much, but they do. Like in Kerala, in Bangalore, people are stopping the supercars for exhaust. That's the late, latest article yes. that yeah. you know. So they know they will stop you and say, "Yeah, your exhaust is something put on Then they'll say they know Acropovic, they know Miltech. Yeah. I've been stopped in the law a couple of times saying, "Boy, what is it put on? Miltech is put on. Miltech is what is it? Why is Skoda not written? If it's in the factory, then it's Skoda. Why is it put on? Why is Miltech not written here? So they know yeah. they are not silly. So yeah. the awareness is coming. It's not. Too strong, but yeah, the, the tech is catching up, and people are getting more aware. But then, since like there are people like us who are investing so much in older cars, like building them, and then there's this new rule coming that you have to scrap your car. I mean, we cannot. We can just build it according to the track spec. Like I'll only run it on the track. I won't make it a daily. Uh, as per Indian law, even modifying the wheels on your car is yeah. illegal. Yeah. So it's just that the cops don't enforce it, and thank you for the, thank you to them for not doing that. But the law needs to change before this. Like for example, in the U.S., the new law, which is WTPL or something, some new law which has come up because of which all decat tunes are now turned off. Earlier, even in the U.S., like U.S., I used to run a decat car. My STI was a decat, and I had a removable cat. Later on, I got a removable cat when I could save enough money to buy one. But it was a decat car. And right okay. before the inspection would happen, I would swap my old down, new downpipe out and put in my old downpipe. And that's how I got to working, you know, understanding it. But U.S. has scrapped the law that you cannot have a car in the U.S. Won't buy a street car and modify it to race spec and say it is for off-road use only. That is no okay. longer an option. So similarly, in India, I think there was a legislation I think last to last government they had put in a decision in which you could keep like these hobby cars as you could call them. So while your cars, for example, that never saw the light of day, but that regulation is still in somewhere in the parliament pending, which says that yes, you can keep a 
old car, the collector's car and luxury car, but you're not allowed to drive it on the speed more than X amount of kilometers. Or you got to, if you're going to use for motorsport or kind of events, you have to put it in a truck and take it. Trailer. Yeah, that's that. Yeah. But yeah, we don't have the facility. We don't have trailers available. I know how much, how many of us can actually afford to buy a trailer afford and then to. buy a SUV which can <laughs> tow the damn trailer. So it's exactly. a mixed bag. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's that really there. Coming back to the LoRa, you know, when, when they started building the LoRa, it was more or less the fastest thing on the Delhi streets. Except for Ferraris and Porsches, right? I could I yeah. could take on Caymans, the the regular naturally aspirated Caymans. I was faster than them. My friend bought a S4. I literally obliterated his car, like pulled like 20 car lengths. That video is yeah. on YouTube. So, but eventually everybody catches up. You know, the Laura, the Tabahi, as we used to call it, it was the name given to the car by my friend who drove it. He's like, oh my God, what the fuck? He had no, he's like, ye kya karte thi? Tabahi hai. <laughs> So that's where the name came from. So you know, people get into this ego matches about, oh, Tabai is faster than your car, Tabai is faster. I'm like, no, you know, there will be cars which will be much faster. You know, Tabahi, the Laura 1.8 TSI was a great engine for its time. It's the, it's, yeah. it was, I bought it in 2000, what do you go, 10? I bought the car, it's 2020. In 20 years, engine technology has come a lot more ahead. It right? When, when the first... When the first Octavia RS, the new RS came into India, up till stage two, the buy was faster, right? Yeah. But that all depends on how fast you could change the gears. If I True. missed a gear, which I'm infamous for, missing a gear, <laughs> so, yeah. Please don't the mischief, mischief while downshifting. Like, I don't don't I, I, but oh but then God. since since I've been, I've been a track instructor in the US, so I do know if I fuck up, I know how to mismanage the amount of fuck up I do. I put the clutch in, so it's, yeah. it's save the gear, save the car also. Save the box. Yeah, save the box. Yeah, I, I've blown the gearbox, by the way. The, oh my, the, the, my differential pin broke off because I was generating right. so much torque in the Tawai that towards the end of the car, like, towards, I think, about a year back, the I was coming back from a drag. I'm kind of a friendly street, legal street race, let's call it. Yeah, <laughs> so I was coming back and I had launched the car too hard and Suddenly I hear a tongue and then I see, you know, I lose power and the gears won't engage. And I look oh, at, yeah. pull the car over, see something is spraying on the car. And I thought my, you know, the, the rear main seal had gone. But it turned out that I had created a hole in my gearbox. Oh, my because God. the differential was open differential and the diff pin yeah. was basically riveted in. And the rivets broke oh. and the diff pin oh, hit my gearbox, put a hole through my gearbox. Fortunately, yeah. engine was okay, so we rebuilt the gearbox, put an LSG in it, put it in. So yeah, no, like I said, saying let's go. So the the, the Skoda 1.8 TSI was a really fast car when it came out. Yeah. The point which I moderate was potentially one of the best handling cars I could front wheel drive cars you could find. But technology moves on, engine technology moves on. So yeah. Um. So I actually just want to shift gears here. Um. Mm-hmm. No pun intended. But no, um... <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish I could. I'm I'm stuck with automatics now. <laughs> oh, yeah. But um. So you obviously um. You know you have a day job with Nokia. You are the project planning lead there. Um, yeah. And you've been in the role since 2014. I did a bit of LinkedIn stalking there. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah. um. And you know, when we had that initial conversation, uh, hmm. we Siddhant asked you that, how do you manage uh, that job and, you know, running a YouTube channel? So for a lot of people hmm. who don't know, Prithvi runs a YouTube channel, which has really interesting content and we'll link the, uh, we'll, we'll have a link in the description below. But, Thank you. And it just comes and you told us something that really stuck with me and it said, and you said that it all comes down to mindset. So what has that journey been like where you're doing something else in the morning, but you're shifting gears again, no pun intended and yeah. doing something that you really like on the side. And you know, something that is, uh, is very successful in its own way. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. So it's mindset. You're right. It's about, it's about knowing when to draw a line between work and life. You know, unfortunately in our country, at least in my friend circle, people are obsessed with the jobs and they make the job their life. And they have nothing else beyond the job, you know, and True. there's nothing wrong in that. If you have a good job, like if I am, if I am a businessman, I would want to do that. But for me, I see the job as a means to an end. I'm good at what I do. And 
I am very good at what I do, so I get paid enough. But I'm not gonna be be obsessed with my job. You know, it's the means to an end, and it's about work culture also. It's about the kind of culture you want to build, create. Fortunately for me, I am senior enough to have a team, and the team I have is fantastic. They are very, very good people. They are extremely competent. They are. You give them a task, they'll go and do it. So. having a good team knowing that you know you want to have a life beyond work it's a balancing act but it has a lot to do with how you approach it you know if you want to micromanage everything you will not have time to do what i do if you want to be obsessed with your job you're not going to have time to do what i do if you are obsessed with your hobby you will never earn enough to fund that hobby the third balance it's a balancing act you know you need to gauge how much effort you need to put into your work to get what result and how much effort you need to put into your hobby to get more results and balance balance do your you know i i had the special projects for nokia you know business planning and special projects for nokia in india you know not a not a easy role because we are a 1.6 billion euro revenue company just from india right so oh my god that's the kind of the scale of revenues we are managing so it's it's not an easy job but you have to ensure that you have a good team who are willing to help you and as well as you know ensure that you're you're not spending too much time with your hobby also like i know i spend a obscene amount of time researching the car parts on the internet you know even before i was you guys were calling i was looking at uh, how to improve the aero under the car right now so there are a lot of oem books i can parse you're looking at so yeah, then a message came from my boss saying that you no know, i need this thing i need to see this report and i immediately switch gears and when i finished that report finished off be efficient at what you do do it do things smart not hard yeah. so it doesn't matter how much time you spend in office it's about how effective you, you are in office it's about what you do you know i can spend i can go to office at 10 o'clock leave at 4 o'clock and do the work of 8 hours or i can spend 8 hours in the office doing work of 4 hours i choose to do the former my boss is very helpful that way it's very good to have seniors who respect your personal space also like you no know, it's it's a matter of some people have the ability to do it some people don't i have it so i'm exploiting it some day maybe i won't have it then i'll figure out another way but there is no golden formula to it you do you take life as it comes you see what works for you and what works for people around you and you adapt and then you do your own thing in your own time yeah well um so Prithvi, it has been really great talking to you. Uh, we really had a fun session, and you know, again, this th- I really wanted to talk about and explore this last point uh, in itself because you know we're doing yeah. the same thing, managing different roles, as you said, and you yeah. just you just spot on on how balance is a very important thing, and of course, diving deep into Tabai was another pleasure in itself. I mean, I try to answer as many questions as people get me. I I am <laughs> I am not the be all and end all. There's always there are people who know far more than i do i just know my platform well enough to be able to talk about the platform that i work on if you ask yeah. me that can how can i make a can i make a 2jz engine i have no idea of that engine i know the engine is good i have some basic rough idea but i i only know my platform yeah so yeah well, it's it's a really good platform and uh, if you're a motorsport enthusiast do check out prithvi's uh, youtube account a uh, youtube channel as well as his inst- and reach out to him on his instagram account he's really help please feel free please feel free and he has some really fun content as well he posts memes so that's one <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah that's insta i am very memes. important <laughs> exactly um well prithvi thank you so much hope you keep safe hope your family is also doing well and yeah you too guys thank you so much for thank you being thank with you. us yeah no problem thank, thank you there is all you. all the best for your efforts guys thank you so much. thank you so much bye bye bye